we welcome back Phil Tuttle for uh, the third of four messages on mentors who have uh, helped shape his life. Would you join me in welcoming uh, Phil Tuttle? Well, hello there. It's supposed to be the friendly Texas state. What's the deal with that? Yeah, that's true. I come bearing gifts. Maybe that'll loosen you up a little bit. Um, as you leave today, there's a, a packet uh, that Tori Bates and some other students have prepared for you. Tori's mom works with us at Walk Through the Bible in Atlanta, and so he helped assemble this. And let me just tell you real quickly what's in here. Uh, it took major string pulling to put this together. Uh, first of all, there's a, a sample of our, one of our monthly magazines called In Word that it will also educate you a little bit about Walk Through the Bible. Uh, the devotional in here is so loaded with sermon starters and illustrations, uh, as well as just ministering to your own personal life. This is what my wife and I are going through this year, and this is an absolute winner. And I would also say, if any of you love to write, our flagship devotional, Daily Walk, was written years ago by a DTS grad named John Hoover. And uh, I have been told if I can find another student or two like John Hoover, I'm supposed to take you in my suitcase back to Atlanta uh, when I go. Uh, there's also an opportunity to subscribe to that. Here's a little brochure about Walk Through the Bible. Um, but this is probably what I'm most excited about. We're just now developing a series called How to Grow a High Impact Church. Uh, more and more and more, Walk Through the Bible's focus will be on serving pastors, strengthening churches. This is going to be a 12-part series. Here's just one session out of this to whet your appetite a little bit. Um, something that I bumped my head in over and over and over. What are the predictable plateaus that a ministry hits, and what do you as the leader need to do to get through those plateaus? So very practical. A nice letter from me. Very nice letter from me. And then I'm so pleased about this. I didn't know if, if this got approved or not. I'm only a senior vice president, so I don't have much influence there. Um, but it says, buy the tools you need. If there's one thing I know about seminary, it's a time to collect resources. And this really pleases me. It says, special discount for DTS students. This would also include faculty. As a full-time employee, I get 40% off. Um, for the next month on our website, you can have my same employee discount. And that includes any of the resources that, that Walk Through the Bible has developed on there. So I hope that you'll go and explore and, and take advantage of that. And um, really what we're after is a long-term relationship of serving churches and especially serving those who serve Christ's church. Now let's jump in. We have looked so far at two of my favorite Bible characters, two friends who won't let me quit even when I want to. And today, we're going to meet a friend that uh, actually met years ago right here on campus in a, in a Bible exposition class. And chances are when we get into this, you go, I already know about this guy. Well, hopefully I've packaged it a, a little bit in a fresh way, and, and my illustrations will be different. Um, but this is one of those friends who has just walked with me now through 25 years of teaching and preaching ministry, and you need to know him better than you know him. This is actually part of a little series that I preached recently called Encouragement, the Oxygen of the Soul. Uh, the place where I went and pastored right after seminary almost suffocated me. It was a combination of two things now that I look back on it. Well, three, really. Number one, I was all alone, and um, I'm not a good all-alone type of person. I had my wife there, of course. We had some leadership in the church, but there really wasn't any contact at all between other pastors in the community. And our church thought that that was probably a good thing, that there not be much contact. And uh, so I was really pretty isolated. You add to that that it was a community that had been settled by Germans. And Germans have a very interesting view of life that, you know, if it's great, then you can just assume it's great. And if it's not great, then we'll tell you about it. And that's an interesting place to pastor. You add to that that the majority of this church had come from a denomination that's, that's really pretty small, uh, and they had had, at least in this particular area, a great deal of false teaching that actually said, if you ever compliment somebody, you've done that man or woman a great disservice because you've robbed that person of their heavenly reward. And you can kind of figure out the verse that that sort of came from, but they don't explain these rules when you move in. 
you just bump into them randomly and go, how come 95% of what's going on in our church is so positive, but 98% of our elder meetings are totally negative? That's because elders are to guard the flock and make sure things don't break, and that's just our job. And uh, I, I was dying in that environment. And God took me back to what the word really says about encouragement. There's the exhortation. This is where we want to start today. You know these verses. They're familiar. Hebrews 10, 24, and 25. Let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together. You cannot do this in isolation, as some are in the habit of doing. But let us encourage one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. The implication is, as time moves toward its end, as we get closer to the return of Jesus Christ, that our need for encouragement actually increases. It's a very important truth. That's the offensive part. That's saying we encourage each other in order to stimulate each other to love and good deeds. We also play defense with encouragement. See to it, brothers, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But encourage one another daily as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. How many of you have purposefully encouraged somebody already today? Raise your hand. Okay, that's not too bad. All right, it's almost 11. What that means is you still have 13 hours and 5 minutes to avoid disobedience in this one today. We're we're told to do this every day. Well, yeah, but we're on a seminary campus. Look at those words carefully. You can, my friends, develop a sinful, unbelieving heart in the midst of this glorious environment. You can take this book and you can reduce this book to a textbook. You can bypass the step of letting this book change you and you can do like I have done multiple times in my life where I open this book and go, oh, I gotta get something for the men on Tuesday morning. I gotta have something for Wednesday morning prayer meeting. I've gotta get something for on the radio. I gotta have something for Sunday night. What am I gonna share Sunday morning? And we bypass that critical step of letting this book change us first. And when we do that, we're, we're far down the road toward the development of a sinful, unbelieving heart. It also says in here that we can get hardened by sin's deceitfulness. And if you believe that an education moves you beyond the deceitfulness of sin, I would really encourage you to look at how many great saints in the Bible fell into total deceit. You you can start with David, and and there's a, a feast right there of study. But to move on through, Satan is so deceptive. We all believe lies. Well, what lies do you believe? You can't name them. We don't know they're lies. We believe that they're the truth. We really believe that we're in competition with other students. We do. Now, we're we're good about it. It's good-natured competition. But the picture in our mind is that there's a finite job market out there. There are nearly infinite needs when you graduate from here. We're not in competition. Each other are not the enemy. Satan's the enemy. Anyway, we've got so much to cover in here. Many times... In Scripture, when God gives us instruction, when he gives us exhortation, then he's going to follow it up with a person who's like the poster child for that. The exhortation is like you would read in the dictionary. Then you turn to the encyclopedia and you look it up, and and it'll have a picture of the person who lived this out. And in this case, it's a man by the name of Barnabas. Very dangerous topic to talk on at Dallas Seminary, especially when Prof. Hendricks decides to make a surprise visit. I don't even remember after 25 years what I ripped off from whom. So it's a. <laughs> let's throw some footnotes in there on the screen where they really belong. If you were to read his tombstone, Barnabas would be described this way He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. I submit to you, I'll take that on my tombstone any day, especially if it's etched by the Holy Spirit himself. Well, what made him receive this kind of uh, applause from heaven? There were really three things that he did, and this is where I want us to get very, very, very practical this morning. And and profs, I'd really encourage you to jump in because your role in setting this tone at this institution carries the day. First behavior, Joseph, 
This is from Acts 4, 36 and 37. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. We'll talk about what he did in a minute, but let's hold it right there. His name was Joseph. And I hope that you've picked up during your studies here, whether that's one year or seven years so far, that names are a really big deal in Bible times. That there's something about a person's name and the destiny that, that they are to live up into. One of the first funerals I had was from a lady who did not go to our church. And, uh, you know, that's, that's a very difficult situation. And I had already buried her son and her daughter-in-law, who were both blind and met in blind school. And, and now the mother died. And I really did not know her very well. She, she wasn't from right in that area. And it was very interesting as I met each of her children. Each of her children had biblical names. And you, you always want to resist the temptation to try to preach somebody into heaven. But to think of the silent prayer that was prayed for each of those children. And I just simply went through those names and what those names taught us about God. Names are a big deal in Bible times. My parents, I guess they tried, but they really missed. Uh, Philip actually means lover of horses. <laughs> Doesn't it? Yeah, well, I'm not. Tuttle is probably German from Toot Hill, which means graveyard, and so maybe lover of dead horses or something, I don't know. But I'm in a family where everybody else loves to ride. And so we'll go maybe to Colorado on vacation, and everybody's like, let's go riding. And I'm like, oh boy, let's do. And, and uh, they, they, won't, they won't let me get out of it. I have to go. And so it always goes the same way. They'll ask my wife, have you ridden much? And she'll say, well, I don't want just a nose-to-tail horse. I want, a, I want a horse with a little spirit. And, and they'll go, oh, you'll love Frisky. And she'll go, well, now I don't ride a lot now. And they'll go, no, no, Frisky's fine. But he's not just a follower. You know, he's, he likes to lead. And well, I say, all right, bring him on. Then they'll turn to my daughter. My daughter's like, um, I live in Atlanta. And like, we drive cars there. <laughs> and... Um, I, I, I want a horse that just follows. And they'll go, you'll love Velvet. Velvet is smooth. And then they turn to my son, who's actually ridden less than my daughter. He goes, I want the wildest thing you've got on the lot. <laughs> and my wife and daughter are going, no, 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 no. And so they give him some horse. They'll go, ah, you'll love Rocky. And Rocky is actually the twin brother of Velvet, but they don't tell him that. <laughs> and they're winking at my wife. And then they look at me, and they don't even ask me if I've ridden much. I don't know why they skip that step. And they look at me, and then they look at their horses, and then they look at me, and then they look at their horses. And then they always do the same thing. They go, bring, and they turn to the back lot. <laughs> where there's these horses that flunked out of remedial Clydesdale training. My, this is no kidding. My last few horses have been named Sarge, Brutus, and Satan. <laughs> Okay, so, so lover of horses, <laughs> no. Well, this is one time, this is one time even in Bible times where the friends of Joseph said, we love your mom and dad, but they could have done a little better. We're going to name you Barnabas, which literally means son of encouragement. And you know the connection between the verb to encourage, parakaleo, and the name for the Holy Spirit, paraclete. And what they're really saying is, is Joseph, when you come alongside us, which is literally what that word means, your effect on us is as if the Holy Spirit himself came right next to us. What a tribute. And so they said, from now on, we're going to call you Barnabas. Well, what did he do that got him this name? We have several examples in the book of Acts. Verse 37, it says, he sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. You know, the the uh, place of this in the storyline. Acts 2 is Pentecost. People from all over the empire have come. Many have put their faith in Jesus Christ. There's been supernatural outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And then they stay and they want to be taught. And you know, you don't just run down to an ATM. There were no ATMs. And they didn't think they'd be there quite that long, so they soon run out of money. And so people are sharing together. And, and you know, where are we going to stay? Most of the motels were places of ill repute. So people are bringing folks into their home, much like after Hurricane Katrina, really. And, and people are really meeting each other's needs. Barnabas goes, we've got some land. You know, it's out there on Cyprus. I was there a couple years ago. I would love to have land on Cyprus. This cannot have been an easy decision. But he took, sold the land, brought it to the apostles' feet. 
If you were to summarize that, here's his first behavior. He recognized a need and he met it. Say that with me. He recognized a need. Right. You don't have to wait till you graduate to begin to do that, by the way. It can be a financial need. I was engaged when I, when I came here and um, had worked really hard working road construction the summer before I started, but there was, there was no money to get back to Charlotte, North Carolina, where my wife lived. And I must have really whined and howled at the moon because one day I came uh, to my little post office box and there was $200 there. And it, it, it was not from an outside source, it was from seminary buddies who said, we're really sick of hearing about her. Go visit her this weekend. <laughs> you can get a ticket for $198 if you hurry on American. And uh, that, that, was, oh, that was fantastic. Just split it right in the middle and gave me enough faith to come back here and gut it out for another couple of months. <sighs> they saw a need and they met it. John Hoover, who I mentioned earlier, um, who graduated from DTS, wrote The Daily Walk, which is still our flagship publication. Uh, he went to be with the Lord much earlier than any of us would have ever thought. 6'6", six, six, good health, um, and God just took him home uh, about, I guess, eight years ago. Well, after his death, all this stuff started coming out that nobody had known who had done stuff around our office, and most of it turned out to be John. You had single moms saying, they would ask his widow, who now works for us in accounting, they would say, Diane, do you ever remember John? Did, did he mess with my car once? And she goes, oh, those tires you were driving on. He told me about them. And we saved up. It took us about a month and a half to get the money together. But you left your keys on your desk one day, and he just took your keys, took it down, put four new tires on. You cannot believe how much joy that brought to my husband, John. And there were multiple accounts of this. Well, but I don't have that kind of resources. There's all sorts of ways to do that. It doesn't always have to be financial. Sometimes it's just seeing somebody who always seems to be alone and going, hey, after chapel, how about we sit together at lunch? Don't let anybody float through here alone just because they're not as extroverted as you are. I was one of those very, very, very introverted people. Don't let people float through here alone. It can be so many different things. My parents' church had this group called the bodybuilders. And the bodybuilders were these crazy people. I still don't know who they are. I have some theories. But what the bodybuilders did was they would find people ministering in the church, and just to encourage them, they'd find out when they were home, and they'd send them a pizza to their door. And on the cover of the box, it said, we caught you serving in our church. Enjoy the pizza, the bodybuilders. Now, how many people in the average size church do you think it takes with that mindset to make that an absolutely exciting place to worship? Only trouble with this, this is not an officially sanctioned ministry of the church. So they start asking the pastor, and the pastor has no clue about this. In fact, he's been the victim of a pizza hit himself. <laughs> and um, so the pastor tries to investigate, and nobody's talking about this. I heard it got so bad, the pastor goes to Domino's, and he says, or actually Pizza Hut, and he says, um, there are some folks from our church, they buy from you consistently, they're called the bodybuilders, oh yeah, some of our best customers. What are their names? We don't know, they always pay cash. Well, I have the Olin Mills Church directory here, I'd like you to just flip through here, <laughs> see if any of these faces look familiar. They're like, are you dreaming? We've been warned. If, if we talk, all this business goes to Domino's. Forget it. We're not talking. <laughs> Get creative with this one. Get creative with this one. If somebody in your midst just had twins, you don't need to pray about whether they need help. <laughs> we only had ours one at a time. You can come help us. It's... He recognized a need and he met it. Second behavior, Acts 9, 26 and 27. When he, that is Paul, the one used to be known as Saul, came to Jerusalem, this right after his conversion on the Damascus Road, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he really was a disciple, but Barnabas. Look at those two little words. Talk about structural indicators, but that conjunction, that contrast, but Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. 
If you boil that down to its essence, you know what Barnabas did? He recognized faith and he nurtured it. Everybody else is saying, how stupid do you think we are? Mama drowned all the really dumb ones is how they say it in Georgia. We are not, we are not fools. We didn't fall off the turnip, fall off the turnip truck yesterday. That, you know, various ways of saying it in the original Greek. You can study those out. <laughs> but here, here's, here's Barnabas and he goes, no, this is legitimate faith. One of the things you will walk into when you leave here is you will walk into a group of people who, for whatever reason, has doubts about certain methods of evangelism. Um, The place I went, they had big doubts about childhood evangelism. It's a very interesting thing since I came to Christ in a good news club at the age of eight. So that was a wonderful stronghold to attack. And I took great delight. Oh, I've done some really dumb things since I was eight, There's times when I've wandered and made poor decisions that didn't please the Lord, but I've never doubted that the transaction of faith that changed my eternal destiny happened that afternoon after school. Kids can come to know Christ. Also in that same church, there was a great wariness about any kind of mass evangelism. That was fun too, since my wife came to know Christ at a Billy Graham crusade in Madison Square Gardens. And different people would quote the percentages of those conversions that supposedly stuck, and she would just say, well, 100% of my conversion stuck. (laughs) You know what? If we did this physically, think of that. The physical often illustrates the spiritual. In our little town, there would be people who who placed their trust in Christ, and there was this this attitude of, let's see if they really follow through with it, because they could really embarrass God and our church. You know what that's like? That's like a baby being born over at Baylor Hospital, the doctor and the nurse going, wow, it sure looks like a new life. It cries, it blinks. Look at that, two eyes and nose, perfectly healthy. I I wonder if it's a real baby or not. Let's set that baby out in a snowdrift for a couple of years and see how it does. Okay, we build homes for people who even have those thoughts. They're called things like peaceful willows and places like that. We would never do that physically. Why do we ever take a wait and see attitude spiritually? Had a guy in our church, Dr. Grasmick, and I were talking about this gentleman yesterday. He, he was, he, no way did he have any interest in church. And um, God used me, but he mainly used some other folks that this guy was gloriously converted. And then he became rabid for the kingdom. His name was Donnie, and he would come every morning to our house. My wife and I called it our DDD, our daily Donnie dose. And he didn't have a clock. He didn't know what time you should get up in the morning. He was a welder and a farmer, and we'd hear his truck, and we'd go, ah, it's morning. And uh, you know, one of us would jump out of bed, and he'd go, got this tape or whatever. He had a terrible habit of saying whatever. Got this tape or whatever in the mail or whatever. I listened to it. It's some guy named Chuck Swindle or whatever. You ever heard of him or whatever? It's, it's really great. He preaches way better than you or whatever. You ought to listen to him. You know? <laughs> Every day. I couldn't listen to tapes to begin to keep up with this guy's appetite. Donnie comes to Wednesday night church, which is like me and a few close friends, right? And, and the average, <laughs> average time of walking with Christ is four decades plus. I love this group of people. They were, they were just, ah, they, they were my foundation in this church. And here's Donnie shows up, and we're going to pray. And, and, you know, we'd go in a circle, and I almost said, Donnie, you don't have to pray. But I'm glad I didn't, because after all these perfect King James prayers, it comes to Donnie, and he goes, well, Lord, or whatever, this is Donnie or whatever, uh, I guess you know me or whatever because you know everything, don't you? And I just want to say thank you for making me your kid. And uh, says, um, I, I don't know how to say it like my friends here. Someday I'll learn how to say it right. Just today I want to say you're like loaded dice or whatever because you can't be beat. <laughs> and, I, and I look up out of one eye and everybody else in the room has got at least one eye open and the and the tears are flowing, and I'm picturing God in heaven going, yes, somebody authentic, this is awesome, this is great. I'll tell you what that triggered in our church. I said, how many of you thought you would ever have Donnie sitting here with us? I'll never forget the night I baptized him. It was a glorious night. 
I said, how many of you thought that? Nobody believed that. We made a list. You can't do this in a city. We made a list of the 10 least likely to ever come to know Christ in our community. <laughs> and the 10 least likely became our 10 most wanted. And before, before I left there, four of them were brothers and sisters in Christ, and two more have joined the family of God since I was there. What's the deal? Look for people who have faith. It can be new faith, it can be weak faith, but find that faith and nurture it. He did it with the whole group in Acts 11, not, not just individually with Paul. News of this, what's that? The conversion of the Gentiles reached the church at Jerusalem. It got back to headquarters at DTS right there. And they sent Barnabas to Antioch. Good choice. Good choice. When he arrived and saw the evidence of the grace of God, I picture this as like CSI, and he goes, God's fingerprints are all over this crime scene here. He was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. Look at the, look at the order of that. First of all, he was glad. He experienced personal joy at the conversion of people, even if he had to rearrange all of his paradigms. And then after that, what did he do? He encouraged them to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. Behavior three. This is also out of Acts 11, just right on the next verses. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. Why? Because Antioch needed a pastor. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. I missed that on an exam here. I said that it happened in Jerusalem. It was actually Antioch. I remember that 25 years later. Here's the behavior. What's he doing here? He recognized potential and he developed it. Paul, for years, has been out of the storyline. I'll bet he was frustrated as can be with that being as driven as he seems to have been. Having done as much damage to the kingdom of God, he must have been, I've got to make a difference. I've got to do something positive. I've got I've to do, in the time I've got left, double what I undid. And God takes him to a faraway place to work in him before he can work through him. But Barnabas doesn't forget him. He recognized potential, and he developed that. I would encourage you to find out who has done that in your life. One of the guys was a man named Dr. Marvin DeHaan. His son and I went to college together. We would go out and rake leaves at his house outside of Chicago. He would pay us, this is a long time ago, this is in the late 70s, he would pay us 10 bucks an hour to rake leaves. And they'd cook a steak, and then he'd draw his latest theological theories on a board, and we'd have four-hour meals, and he'd pay us for that too. He just was looking for excuses to give us money is really what was going on. And uh, he had a Mercedes 450 SL, and Chris and I thought maybe God might be leading us to Dallas Seminary. And he's like, if I ask my dad, no way will we get the Mercedes. You ask him. And I'm beating around the bush and can't bring myself to ask. And he says, I've heard you guys may want to check out Dallas Seminary. And he says, Marilyn, would you go in my study? And they came out, and he brought us two tickets on American Airlines. Gave one to Chris and one to me. And I, I, nobody had ever invested in my life before. And I was very uncomfortable with this. I said, I don't know when I could pay you back. You know, I, I just said, oh, no, no, he races his board. Obligation is not circular in the body of Christ. It's chain reaction, you know. <laughs> and it, one of the joys of my life has been to buy a few plane tickets for people to come down and check out the seminary. It all started that day. A few years ago, I'm preaching up at Maranatha Conference Center in Michigan, and my son's fishing, and he'd take the fish he caught, and he'd take them to the ladies, and this one lady goes, honey, I've got enough fish. Why don't you go next door to Mrs. DeHaan's house? I go, Mrs. DeHaan's house? You go, Marilyn. I go, married to Marv? And I hadn't seen him in years. And he got to come to that Bible conference, and uh, we had a reunion, sweeter than sweet, and he says, I think that may have been the best $229 I ever invested in the kingdom of God. You look at the faces on this, on this platform right here. They saw potential in me and a lot of my classmates before any of us saw it. I will guarantee you that. Believe them when they say they see potential in you. But what about in each other? You know, there, there are manuscripts for books that some of you haven't mailed in yet because you might get rejected and the church 
is weaker and getting weaker by the day theologically because you're reluctant to take that risk. So all the potential is not out there. It's here as well. He recognized potential and he developed it. We got to fly. Sometime later, Paul said to Barnabas, let's go back, visit the brothers in all the towns where we preach the word of the Lord and see how they're doing. Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark, with them. You know this story. Paul did not think it wise to take him. Why? Because John Mark had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in the work. They had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. This is still how we plant churches. We multiply by division. Barnabas took Mark and sailed for Cyprus. Paul chose Silas and left. And God somehow uses even our conflicts to his glory. But who was right? They're both right. The work is too important to be entrusted to somebody who's not dependable. True statement. It's also equally true that if you don't give people second chances, I mean, can't you imagine Barnabas going, Paul, if anybody ought to believe in second chances, I think it's you. Is your memory really that short? And, you know, there's friction between them, and so they part ways. You know the rest of the story. We have a delightful gospel called the Gospel of Mark that we wouldn't have had Barnabas not reclaimed him, most likely. And even Paul, toward the end of his life, says, send John Mark to me. He's useful for service. He redeemed a life here. So he recognized potential and he developed it. Really simple question today. What need will you meet this week? This is the best pastoral, this is the best ministry training you can get to simply learn to view people through the eyes of the Savior. It's a discipline. It's a discipline. There were so many times pastoring, I didn't think I had anything to say. And I'd close in prayer and start to get up, and they'd go, just sit here a while longer. We just read us another psalm? Sometimes it's just the ministry of presence, not brilliant insights. Whose faith will you nurture this week? Who's having a hard time believing that God really led them here to DTS? Whose potential will you develop this week? Student to student? with your kids, with your spouses, professors obviously with students, but professors with one another, and students, I'm telling you, a word of encouragement from a student to a professor can go a very long way sometimes. Let's pray. Lord, I would ask you in the quietness of this moment that literally to every person in this room you would bring a face across our mind a name. Somebody who has potential that they don't see yet. And they need a, an arm around their shoulder right now. Somebody whose faith is wavering because of whatever issue. And somebody who has a need that needs to be met, even if it can't be done individually that there would be groups of students who say, we can take that on as a group. Lord, I thank you for Barnabas. I thank you that he truly, truly was a man full of the Holy Spirit and that the net, net result of his life was a great many people were brought to the Lord. And even though he didn't very often pull the headlines, the impact that he had through those that he shaped literally goes on to this day. May you raise up the next generation of Barnabases right here in this room because your church is so weak and so anemic and so desperately in need of encouragement that we must rise to this task. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.